Hello, I'm John Gribben from Bart's Cancer Institute in London. We're at ASH in 2015 in very sunny Orlando, and I'm joined by my good friend, Professor Stefan Stilgenbauer from the University of Ulm in Germany. So Stefan, lots of new news here, of course, as usual. A lot, of course, about um, Ibrutinib. Um, I think uh, all, we all agree a very exciting advance in terms of the treatment for CLL. I'd like to do spend a little bit of time today thinking about who you know who are the right patients to be considering ibrutinib, when a patient should consider going on the drug, and what they should think about going onto the drug, rather than focus on this session particularly about some of the new things that are appearing. Hmm. But of course, we are seeing lots more data appear, lots more mature data, and lots of new clinical trial information. So, for you, what is the major advance that we see in terms of having a as a as a as a treatment for our patients with CLL? Right. I mean, John. Traditionally, I mean, ibrutinib has been licensed for the you know relapsed refractory population, for the high risk population with the 17p deletion or TP53 mutation, and I mean, rightly so because these are the patients traditionally that with chemoimmunotherapy had very very poor outcome, and for whom ibrutinib really was a breakthrough, and still is a breakthrough. Now, um, as you say, we are moving more and more to earlier treatment lines, and at this meeting, data will be presented actually from the frontline mm. trial, mm. Resonate 2, for patients uh, over the age of 65. And again, I mean, everybody knows from the abstract already that the data will be really overwhelming, overwhelmingly posi positive. Now, we saw, of course, some, not the frontline data, but data pres presented here before from the original Resonate study suggesting a better outcome for people treated earlier in the disease. Now, there are a lot of people out there believing that maybe we should keep this drug to last, last resort. Is, is that your view on how we should be using this drug? Right. I mean, this comes traditionally from the licensing trials where it, where, where it was used kind of in end-stage patients or the ones who really ref were refractory to all other available therapies. I think, as you say, the original Resonate study already indicates that patients with fewer prior lines um, had a better outcome, so was indirect evidence, so to say, uh, supporting earlier use. And uh, I think if the evidence now really from phase three trials in the frontline treatment uh, shows that the outcome of these patients is really so remarkably good, this provides further argument for, uh, for earlier use. Sure. Now, th some patients, you know, are a little bit alarmed by some of the early signals come out of those studies. The first one, of course, is when these studies were first being done, there was this signal that maybe that we're seeing quite a lot of Richter's transformations in those patients. Now, clearly we were. Is it your view that in some way these drugs are causing Richter's transformation? Well, right, as you say, I mean, there, there was quite an incidence of Richter's transformation in the ibrutinib arm or, or in phase two single arm uh, studies um, uh, of ibrutinib causing this, I think, uh, unrightly so, this concern. Um, I mean, biologically, as you know, from uh, um, a biological disease perspective, there's no reason to think why this drug um, should induce uh, Richter's transformation. And I think a good piece of evidence comes from randomized comparisons where you can ca compare both arms and actually uh, with all caveats, the incidence of Richter's transformation is, is somewhat similar in both arms. Although you have to remember that in the ibrutinib arm, the patients simply have been living longer. Sure. And I think in this very high risk refractory patients, simply these patients live much longer today yeah. with ibrutinib and simply they, they fortunately do have the time to then unfortunately experience Richter's transformation, which in the past simply wasn't possible at all because they uh, unfortunately so quickly died from their CLL. I think it's uh, clearly something that we are seeing. However, we are seeing it only due to the benefit that the drug is providing. Sure. Now, you've been involved in some of the studies looking at the mechanisms of resistance. And of course, there are other reasons why a patient may come, come off ibrutinib and then their disease uh, progresses. And we've seen data, and we're going to see more data at this meeting about how we manage uh, such a patient. Should a patient be afraid of going on to ibrutinib because potentially of the speed with which the disease comes off, um, uh, you know, if they're, if they're not able to tolerate the drug or if they become resistant? Right, I think, uh, you know, this again, it, we have to be careful about this data because this data then is looking specifically at this very, very small subset of patients who fail or come off ibrutinib for whatever reason. And uh, historically, the outcome 
has been very poor. How can it be uh, otherwise? I mean, you know, they failed all available therapy, then they went on iprotinib and they had no other option. So, I mean, it's quite clear that they couldn't gain therapeutic benefit because there was nothing available. I think with a bit longer follow-up, the data look a bit different. And now as other options become available with biologically targeted therapy, such as PI3K inhibitors or uh, agents targeting BCL2, obviously these patients get more and more options. Sure. So clearly, um, you know, the few failures and possibly a not so good outcome of those should not uh, distract from uh, the overall great benefit that patients can derive from ibrutinib. So this isn't so much like a glass half full, glass half empty. This is yeah, a I glass mean, 90 percent uh, exactly. full, it's, and people uh, shouldn't I mean, be concerned. It's almost two glasses that you have: yeah, a sure. glass of white and a glass of red wine. Ah, yes. Okay. So, in in general terms, uh, is it your view that we will continue to see the, the ibrutinib and, and other drugs in this class moving earlier and earlier in the treatment course of the disease? I think uh, this is certainly the case. I mean, this is, as I said already, uh, the phase three trial will be presented here at ASH, uh, clearly providing evidence that there is benefit of this early treatment, obviously, and also in, in a very transparent way, we have to talk about things like, you know, cost of these treatments and uh, sustainability of these options. But uh, our prime goal should obviously focus on, should be and focus on um, delivering best possible care to our patients. And from that perspective, clearly, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, these new agents provide a dramatic advance. Now, a lot of the studies have included a lot more elderly patients for whom, of course, chemoimmunotherapy is more difficult to deliver. Does that mean this is just a drug for the elderly? Well, I mean, uh, there's this evolution, as you say. I mean, first it was used or uh, investigated in trials among refractory patients, 17P minus population, and then among elderly, where actually chemoimmunotherapy, which provided great advance, was not an option anyway, at least something like FCR, intense treatments. Now, I mean, uh, we lack randomized comparisons so far in, in young and fit patients in the frontline setting. But when you look at the data that are presented at this meeting among elderly patients with abrutinib, single agent, well-tolerated treatment, the results look so good that in cross-trial comparisons with all caveats, I mean, it's tempting to speculate that in the future, provided there is evidence provided, um, this may also be a very good treatment for young patients. Sure. So we're, here we are, what we're seeing again, a huge amount of data new in CLL um, at this meeting continued evidence to show that more targeted therapies completely revolutionize the way we think about CLL, providing great options for our patients we never had before. Our challenge now to find out exactly how to use these drugs, but what we're hearing clearly is patients should not be afraid of the complications of these agents. They should be more afraid of the disease and the good option they have from the treatment.